Thank you, Jamie. Um, <clears throat> as Jamie said, this is the NARDAC RDA update forum. Um, we are really glad to see that lots of people have registered and look forward to a Q&A session at the end. We're not going to interrupt and, and risk running out of time to answer questions in the middle, but please do use the Q&A function to send us questions as we go. Um, just to uh, let you know, our speakers are uh, members of the RSC and of NARDAC, primarily from NARDAC. We have Thomas uh, Brendorfer, uh, Library and Archives, uh, not uh, Public Library in, in Guelph, Guelph Public Library, uh, who is the NARDAC representative to the RSC, RDA Steering Committee. We have Melanie Poluta, and uh, she'll be covering for Claire Liao, Claire Liao who couldn't join us today. Um, talking about the development of uh, policy statements and external documentation at Library of Congress. We'll have Thibault Tran Phan speaking about uh, the work they're doing in Library and Archives Canada uh, to prepare for RDA. We'll have Robert Maxwell of uh, Brigham Young University uh, discussing the complex organizational underpinnings of uh, NARDAC. And and Kathy Glennon from the RDA Steering Committee will talk about plans at RSC's level. Jamie Henley, James Henley of ALA Publishing will talk about platform developments. And I will uh, bring up the end talking about some encoding questions for RDA. And so I would invite Thomas to uh, get us started. And let me give him control of the screen. I have control. Thank you, Stephen. Yep. Okay, I'll proceed. Hello, everyone. I will be talking today about recent developments from the RDA Steering Committee. And the focus will be on the new community resources section of the new RDA toolkit, much more of which will become visible in the next release of the toolkit in April. That's next month. Uh, the community resources section of the new toolkit is currently undergoing development and fine tuning and it is the successor to the appendices in AACR2 and the original RDA toolkit. Yeah. Well, to help kick things off, here's just a, a brief intro of me and, and a photograph. Uh, well, the picture is in lieu of me standing at a podium in a conference center uh, room uh, live. It is certainly the hope of NARDAC that we will return to in-person updates at ALA at some point, but likely not until 2022. So for reference, since this is about the movement of existing content and its arrangement and the structure of the new toolkit, let's, we can go all the way back and, and see how the original appendices appeared in AACR2. And here at the bottom, we can see some top level categories for, for these additional instructions covering capitalization, abbreviations, numerals, initial articles, glossaries here as well. And if we move into the original uh, RDA toolkit. Uh, we see that there, there was a similar organization to the appendices, but some topics surfaced in this list, such as titles of nobility and dates in the Christian calendar, as well as uh, record syntaxes, which in the new toolkit we would say are really part of string and coding schemes for structured descriptions. Uh, I think at the arrow key a little too soon there, so I've jumped ahead. Uh, when we looked, uh, when we look under the headings in that in the original toolkit, a pattern emerges. Uh, many subtopics appear, but it becomes clear that these are all under the English language. And as we browse down these lists, we eventually encounter headings for other languages and scripts. And here's the expansion of those other languages displayed in full seen under the topics of capitalization and names of persons. And even if you look down at point F11 under names of persons for certain with, uh, with regards to certain names with articles and prepositions, it's broken down yet again under, under that heading into different language, language groups. In the new RDA toolkit, the content from the appendices is, it will be found under the resources tab. Uh, most of it under the menu heading community resources and this screenshot reflects the planned organization for the next toolkit update. 
There's also a, a set of submenus here, one for community refinements and one for community vocabularies. Now, altogether, this organization reflects a, a key separation in the content of the toolkit. The main part of RDA is found under the guidance and entity sections and is, is covered in the element pages, as well as the associated policy statements. Community resources will reflect conventions that are specific to communities. RDA is no longer called the Anglo-American Cataloging Rules. RDA has an international focus and is designed to work in many languages. Now, any refinements or vocabularies that are specific to the Anglo-American community or any other community will be found under community resources. So we need to say that the community resources are a work in progress. The planned organization for the next RDA toolkit update represents the first attempt to create a structure that can support future growth. But it is expected that this section will be further modified and adapted to suit a variety of community needs. All of the current content from the appendices are in the community resources section, but ownership and management of that data needs to be sorted out, as well as the incorporation of conventions specific to other communities adopting RDA. Now, as we dive into this, into the community resources page itself, the landing page, um, we see here presented, this will be in the next uh, update to, to the toolkit. We see here presented some of the reasons given for the separation of the community resources from the main RDA content. Um, the utility of the content is restricted by lo local bibliographic and cultural conventions. And one, one, one other thing that this means is that this content won't be subject to the translation processes that, that are applicable to the main part of RDA. Also, we have to consider the scale of the content that's found here and, and potentially some of that would overwhelm the, the main part if we were to have that in the main part of the toolkit. And I'll, I'll explain that a bit when I talk about community refinements. Now, the initial content planned for this, this, this section, community refinements, are the instructions mainly for authorized access points for those special kinds of works, musical works, religious works, legal works, and official communication. Now, during the RDA beta peri period, this content was marked as special elements and sort of fell outside of the toolkit's main organization. Now, these instructions for authorized access points for these special kinds of works um, pr presented here will be considered as refinements. If all of those instructions were piled into that one element page for authorized access point for work. Well, then you can see why that would be a scalability issue. Uh, that page would be enormous and there would still be the issue of other communities adding their uh, specialized instructions and having that overwhelm that single element page. Now, that being said, there's a lot more work that still needs to be done in, in this section under community refinements. And so in the next slides, I'll focus in on the other section, community vocabularies, and look at how that's organized and, uh, and what's coming up in the next update. So uh, in the April update, when you click on community vocabularies, we'll have this landing page. The second line points out that these are not to be maintained as part of RDA, but are, but are pertinent to different user communities. Now, in practice, this will mean communities will need to consider stepping up and taking ownership over this content, as well as any new content added here. The RSC has been discussing how to work this out, and in particular, uh, considering the kind of assistance that, that could be provided to different communities with content applicable to them. If you look at just one heading here, let's just take a little peek at this. Uh, and the point here I just wanted to draw attention to is to, as to what we're saying here. <laughs> now, this star point reflects a, a common organizational theme for community vocabularies, and it's, it's always focused around uh, how we have organized the entire toolkit, which is around recording methods. So generally, there's two contexts in which we consider these vocabularies these community vocabularies. Uh, one is the context of transcription and the other one is in context of constructing access points and other structured descriptions. 
which is another way to say that this is all about strings. It's all about character strings. Uh, if you look at this section, uh, just this top section uh, at the beginning of terms in specific language languages, we see again, and if you look at the wording, it breaks down again, um, unstructured descriptions. These are community vocabularies in, in the context of, uh, to be used in the context of transcription guidelines. But also each community may have terms conventions used in the in the context of string encoding schemes and chiefly we see this in the construction of access points. So what has become of English well one major thing here is now it's just one language among many. And so that reflects a fundamental principle of the new toolkit that it's not centered on any one language per se. Um, so you'll see all the languages in this next level of organization. So this, the process that went into organizing the, the former appendices involved breaking out under each language and script what topics were covered, such as capitalization and initial articles. And this is a sampling. Uh, and as you can see, not every topic was covered by every language or script. With this new organization, I, you, one could see that there's a benefit when we're cataloging material in a particular language, we can see all of the conventions that would apply to that language in one spot, whether it's for abbreviations, capitalization, initial articles, and so on. So if you look, if you click on terms in English, then we see further organization here. It looks a little, little new here as well. Um, and this is parallel to the toolkits organization by RDA entity and then by element. The conventions that are applicable broadly uh, to, to many entities are under, are under the broader RDA entity heading. And here we find the community vocabulary, vocabulary for initial articles applicable to the names and titles of, of various RDA entities. Under preferred titles of work, well, what do we find here? We see the community vocabularies for collective titles in English and titles in English for the books of the Bible. And here's a screenshot. This is the familiar list for collective titles in English. I just pulled out an arbitrary example just to show how things have changed over the years. And, um, and here we see this organizational shift with um, just a, an example here with soil names. And it was given its own heading under capitalization in, in ACS, ACR2, um, understood to be within the English language context of the appendices. In the new toolkit, um, not only is this specifically organized under the English language, it's also organized under the manifestation entity. And it also leans on the idea that of transcription from manifestation statement elements. Now, even though we don't even record these at the moment, we do take the values of these elements, these manifest manifestation statement elements and modify them further for our traditional elements like title proper. So this instruction is a community specific one for the normalization of transcribed data and the value of that data can be utilized in other, other elements. We can look at another language. And again, we can see the new organization uh, slightly different. You can see there are some different elements covered, uh, covered there, but the organization, the order is generally the same. RDA entity applying to all entities. Uh, the resource entities, work expression manifestation item, uh, if applicable, the agent entities, and then place and time span entities. Initial articles for the French language for, for names and titles of RDA entities that yeah, pops up if you, if you look at that section. So I was thinking of maybe the question, how do we use community resources today? And I thought of uh, something that comes up, oh, every few years in the public library when staff ask, why is this name filed under YRS instead of SIG on the shelf? Irsh uh, Sigur Dar Dotter is an Icelandic name. So in the past, I would, um, 
well, I originally pull up a, a print copy of ACR2 or point to uh, the RDA toolkit and say, ah, to answer that question, we can simply point people to the reason uh, here, which is that it, for Icelandic names, we see, oh, the first, the first part of the first is the given name and that precedes the uh, uh, pat patronym, pat patronymic. Under, and this is under names here. Now, if you look at the new toolkit, it's essentially the same, although the organizational structure is, is uh, apparent as well. You'll see this under terms in Icelandic and under the entity person. Um, it has moved under the access point for person section because this is really about ordering the parts of the name for the purpose of creating an access point. So while this content is accessible in the toolkit, there is another question here, and, and that is of, well, this is a community standard for Icelandic name, but there's also IFLA, which maintains instructions for structuring the names of persons for headings. And IFLA receives updates from various countries um, for these, some of which have been entered as recently as last year. So that kind of gets to a key question of where we stand today with community resources. And this is, this is a, an important question. The conventions we had in the appendices generally, generally reflected what the Anglo-American community had decided for itself. It is possible that the language communities otherwise covered in the appendices may have continued to develop their conventions and perhaps have diverged. And um, this, also, this slide here also plays upon the fact that even within a single language community, there are different conventions, such as the letter U in the word cataloging, and different decisions may be made for vocabularies and their use in elements uh, by, di by different communities. So although the RSC has moved the content from the appendices into community resources, they have also been uh, tagged as potential legacy instructions as communities may bring to the table their own updated conventions. So in addition to the question of legacy instructions, there's also the question of what other future content can be added to community resources. And the first few points here cover categories that already exist in the community resources, such as the, the normalization conventions uh, for each language, capitalization, access point construction. Here, one can also see com community vocabularies that properly belong under community control, such as gender terms. Community the, this section for community resources could also see extensions to carrier and content types. And there is how-to guidance uh, with a uh, building block approach for how these can be constructed, and that's under guidance in the toolkit. Subtypes of current RDA entities and elements may be tied to specific communities. These include the, the shortcut relationship elements, and there's a lot of those in the new toolkit, but they, they parallel pre-existing RDA elements, uh, such as uh, for the contributors of illustrations and textual introductions. But different communities may find it useful to further define subtypes of RDA elements and shortcut elements um, based upon current RDA elements for their own needs and, and implementations. Uh, community resources have been discussed as a location for community application profiles, and there's been discussion about using this section to locate alternative or friendly system labels for the longer reference names for RDA elements. So what is emerging with community resources is the idea that the content should be owned, curated, managed by communities. Uh, with some guidance and some level of technical support from the RSC. This is a topic under active discussion by the RC and input from the communities is welcome. Community resources in the new toolkit represent an immediate solution to finding a place for the legacy instructions from the former appendices, but it is also a structure that could grow with community involvement with the new toolkit. So thank you everyone. And just want to draw attention that uh, there is a, an FAQ that appears on the RDA steering committee website. So look there for further updates. And also just want to mention there are plans to um, uh, add the help information to the help section within the new toolkit in the new toolkit about community resources. So with that, I'll pass the baton to the next person.
So is it mine now? I've requested. You should have control now, Melanie. Okay, I'm just trying to see if it's going to respond. Okay, okay, Whew, there it goes. <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Melly Pluta from the Library of Congress, and I am one of two of the Library of Congress representatives to NARDAC. I do want to mention briefly that this was supposed to originally be a co-presentation with the other LC representative to NARDAC, Clara Liao, also of the Policy Training and Cooperative Programs Division, but she unfortunately had a conflict um, in the last week. So I, some of the content in this presentation she developed, and I am just presenting it on her behalf. So what is the project? Although we continually call this the RDA policy statement project, it is actually a bit more expansive than just the policy statements because we are trying to uh, change all of our documentation uh, where necessary to work with the RDA toolkit. So we're going to start addressing some of the other pieces uh, in this presentation as we get through it. So this is the um, range of people who have been working on it and we, uh, have had some change in who is involved, uh, adding one new person and losing uh, a couple, but we are still very busy and actively working on this project. Now, one of the biggest and the most important things about this project for us has been we have truly lived and died by the power of the spreadsheet. Uh, we are currently just finishing up with our third really large working spreadsheet and about to start on our fourth iteration, which got so large that we decided to split it into three smaller ones. Um, in those three working spreadsheets, the first one was where we analyzed the original existing uh, policy statements for the, from the original RDA toolkit. Uh, the second one was where we then incorporated those in with the writing of many new spreadsheet, uh, new new policy statements, excuse me, uh, so that they are in harmony with the official um, RDA. And, and the process, we have written over 9,000 new ones. Now, one of the things I do want to point out though, in looking at that number is because of how the RDA text has changed, what used to be an, an original RDA, an instruction that said, do it this way, the new RDA says, this is your option of how to do it. And so we have had to write a lot of new policy statements in order just to achieve the same status quo of cataloging. So even though the number is really large, um, it's not really that much new information. We're still trying to achieve the same cataloging impact status quo. The second part of all of this work, of course, is then taking all of those policy statements that we have written out in those spreadsheets and putting them into the data. This example here shows you how that little ID that's highlighted at the, um, in the link that's in the RDA toolkit, that then matches up to the link inside the hidden files that you rarely ever see. And you can see here, this policy statement right here, that's matched up to this, right, this code right here, which is uh, one of the reusable text things that we are trying to use in the data so that we are truly maximizing its capabilities. You can also see the green matches up to the green, the yellow matches up to the yellow. This work uh, does take quite a bit of time as well, but one of the things we did to make that faster was create a batch process. Um, I was, I and Clara were able to work with one of our colleagues in the ILS office who had um, considerably more experience in programming than we did. I had just enough to know these programs could help me do this. And Kelly was able to write several programs that allowed us to bulk load the policy statements into the data files that we then uploaded to the um, content management system for RDA toolkit. Using these pro processes, we were able to upload um, 6,400 plus or so uh, for the December 2020 update. They were our first draft of those many. Um, for the upcoming April update, we finished uploading the rest of them. There's somewhere around 10,000 plus or minus. Uh, a large number of those we were able to not only upload the, the ones we hadn't yet gotten to, but to review the ones we had already uploaded. So some of those have been changed uh, since the December update. So we have been quite busy over the past three months with that work. 
The next uh, stage as we come to the April update is we are looking at uh, developing some forms for feedback. Both of these are in the design stage um, and have not yet been finally approved, although I do think we are going to be sharing one of the two. The first one that we are probably going to be sharing, at least in a beta form, uh, is for just general typographical errors, grammatical issues, spelling issues uh, in the policy statements. If you see an error in the RDA text, you still go to that feedback form at the top, but if you see an error in the policy statement, you're gonna have to go to a different place um, and we will share that when we're ready um, to give feedback on the policy statements. The other form that we're working on, um, and it's going to be part of a larger process, is one where we're going to try to uh, offer an opportunity for proposal, proposals to add or modify the policy statements. Uh, this one is still very much in discussion. We're not yet ready to share it, but we do hope to uh, over the next course of the next year or so. The next big step is the external documentation. So as all of you know, even with original RDA and the policy statements, we still had a whole lot of other documentation that we people had to use to get the work done. And that has continued. And in fact, when we made our initial proposal, we actually took a good deal of stuff that was in the policy statement, such as examples, and we are moving all of that to the external documentation. So we have been working on a plan for doing the metadata guidance documentation. Uh, we are hoping to very much collaborate with PCC in doing this. So other institutions besides LC are going to be involved. And we're planning to start that work um, in early May and hope to finish it by later this year. It's going to be a lengthy process and something of a challenge. But um, it, one point I would want to make is there's not going to be like documentation for every single uh, element that's in the RDA toolkit. That's really not going to be necessary. We're going to be concentrating on those places that will need a lot more, especially, for example, manifestation and work elements and persons and corporate bodies. So now that we actually do have policy statements in the toolkit, uh, and you'll be able to see pretty much all of them next month with the next update. I wanted to go over some of the editorial decisions that uh, we are, we have made as we've written these policy statements and how we've put them into the um, toolkit, but also some of the uh, other helpful things to, for you to know. One point I want, do want to make is that if you want to set up a profile, um, set it up in the toolkit so that you automatically have the policy statements displaying in the right way up rail without any extra steps. You need to set up a profile and then set up a default view. This RDA toolkit YouTube channel that Tom has already mentioned has some training related to this and I would strongly urge you to go check it out and get this set up so that they are in the um, setup so that it automatically displays those policy statements that you always want to see. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the next thing I want to say is how are you going to see them? Because sadly, there are some user display issues. So here we have, excuse me a moment, two options and next to it you have two policy statements. For those of you who haven't yet had a chance to figure this out, that solid blue line at the top indicates that this policy state is attached to that option as does this solid blue line at the top. And the dotted blue line at the bottom indicates this is the end of that policy statement. So you can see that solid and dotted are attached to the second option. But you can see that there's more text attached to that first option that you cannot see. So how do you see it? You hit the send to back that I have circled here. And that will then allow you to see the first option's two policy statements. And as you can see, it's even still bigger. You have to scroll down before you then see that dotted line at the bottom. This is one of the things you need to be aware of that you are not always going to see them uninterruptedly. You sometimes have to use that display, uh, send to back option. Connected with that, sometimes you're still gonna end up with some really long ones and it's gonna be hard to see even with the send to back option working. So one of the things you can do is click on the LC hyphen PCC that's at the top of every policy statement. And if you get click on that, you're going to go to what's called a mirror page for the policy statements. And that's where you will see all of the policy statements for that element uninterrupted. Now, then of course you're left with, wait, I don't see the option that I'm 
replying to? Well, actually you can. <laughs> so then you go to that little icon that's next to the word option. You click on that and you'll see the option next to it. And that is what the, these policy statements are related to. Now, obviously this is not perfect and you then lose context. So this is not a perfect display issue. Um, and it's one we're very aware of, but we do not yet have a solution and we will be working on that. The next thing is, let me talk about some of the other editorial decisions that we have been uh, addressing. One, we'll be talking about what does the reality of an integrating resource mean to the order of information in which we are presenting the policy statements and the facts that we are trying to provide links. So first off, you see here that you have two separate options, but only one of them has a policy statement. Now, why is that? Well, that's because when this was published in December 2020, the second option was new. We had not yet seen it. We had not yet written a policy statement for it. Therefore, we could not publish one for it. This is just the reality of the fact that the RDA toolkit is an integrating resource and the content is always going to be changing at least a little bit. Therefore, policy statements will quite likely regularly be about an update behind. As time goes by, we may be able to increase our speed and, and know more of what's coming and be able to do it in the same update, but that cannot be guaranteed. So this is one of the realities that we have to live with. Next is the order of information when you see them presented in a policy statement, uh, right rail. So whenever we have um, policy statements attached to one location, if we have multiple ones, we're going to consistently try to present them in this order, which is, is it a core statement? That is always going to be first. After that, you will then get practice statements. In this case, you are going to, this is related to the title proper at the pre-recording level, which is where you're usually going to see core statements. And then you have a more general practice statement about the title proper that belongs to the entire element. Sometimes the core statement will be more specific. It may be LC core, it may be PCC core, it may be core related to a specific format. And that will, but that will always come first before any other general practice decisions. Second, sometimes LC and PCC have different practices at the same level. When that happens, well, they're just going to be in alphabetical order because while we discussed the different ways we might put them, we decided that's just too complex. Let's stick with simplicity, alphabetical it is. So anytime you have differing practices, LC and then PCC, because that's the simplest way to do it. Beyond that, we then have the general practice followed by a more specific practice. Sometimes there will be different practices. Sometimes it applies to a specific format. Sometimes it applies to a specific type of resource. In those cases, we have a general practice first followed by a more specific practice. In this one, you can see that it's limited to works with individual titles that are part of a carbon title and therefore it is a more specific practice. Next is the fact that we are trying to provide links within the policy statements as much as possible. So in this example, which is uh, for the element publication statement, we are actually in the policy statement itself giving links to more information where it is necessary. This will also be in many other policy statements. We're trying to link directly to the RDA element that's relevant, the option that's relevant, or another policy statement on some occasions. However, I should note uh, that sometimes the links aren't there yet. In this case, we have a policy statement that already says, see the metadata guidance documents for more information. Eventually, that will be a live link, but at this point it is not because we haven't yet written said documentation and we can't link to it because it doesn't exist yet, but it is to coming. And finally, we do have a, some places where you're gonna see just the word link. Uh, this was, is it a display issue that we at first didn't realize that it was gonna happen. <laughs> and so it took us be a while to figure out the solution, but we do know 
what's going on with it. It has strictly to do with the data markup. The link is active and should work to, to take you to the place. You just don't yet see the display of what that place is. And we do hope to um, clean this up for the next update in July. Next, the editorial decisions. Um, one point we should always make is what is the context of whether or not an element is core. So to give you a brief example, title proper, the element, is a core element. It, at the very beginning, you'll see LCPCC core. But within that, you have a bunch of different options. And then so you always have to ev evaluate the option based on, OK, what's the condition I have to consider? Then I look at the option, and then I look at the policy statement. Knowing if I it is core, I have to provide it. If it meets this condition, then yes, I do apply it. But there are many other elements that are not core. Well, once again, I still have to consider the condition in order to apply the option. But though it says apply the option here, that doesn't automatically mean you must do this. Because first, you as the cataloger decide, am I going to provide data production in the first place? If I do decide, yes, I am, then this tells me how I'm going to do it. You're going to follow this option. But if I've decided I'm not going to be providing data production at all, then the fact that the policy statement says apply the option is irrelevant. So always remember the context of core for the element itself. Uh, it's core, like I said, always generally, well, let me rephrase that, almost always appears at the level of pre-recording. There are a couple of options that are stated as core, but they are very much the exception. Okay, uh, the final editorial decisions that I wanted to review is the overall structure we have for writing the policy statements, that we are trying to very much set up a if this, then that structure for writing the policy statements and avoiding lists whenever possible. So for the first example, we have here the fact that we have four these types of resources, and we list them out and give the, all the detail, then apply the option. So we always have a condition decision set up if there is a condition to applying it. So that is the over, overarching principle that we've tried to stick to in writing policy statements. We haven't always achieved it, but that is the one that we are trying to reach for. Uh, also, when we had places in the old policy statements that had short lists, we actually tried to set those up as if-then statements, because partly because it took less space, uh, but we did want to make them as readable as possible. So there are some places where we did continue to use lists, but this is an example of one where we preferred the if-then structure. So one final editorial decision is, and there are quite a few places uh, that we put either do not record, evaluate later, or some combination of those two statements. And those are for those elements where we haven't made a decision yet. <laughs> There's several new elements in this new RDA toolkit that were not in the original one, and we don't yet have policy statements because we don't yet have an established practice to how, how to do it. So we do hope to work out proposals, uh, LC and PCC together, on how to incorporate those if we so choose. And at that time, new policy statements will be written. There are a bunch of other smaller, more minor policy statement um, editorial decisions that we've made, such as the fact that we are overall sticking with American spelling over British spelling, even when the, the RDA text uses the British spelling. Uh, we do accept the, the presentation of and or for the Boolean um, it, possibilities. We prefer the, the phrase in most cases over generally, which seemed to be popular in the old policy statements. And we did make some vocabulary decisions where we decided to stick with older, more recognizable vocabulary, regardless of how the RDA text had changed it. For example, we are continuing to use multi-part volumes or multi-part monographs to talk about multi-parts because everybody knows what those are, <laughs> and so on. And we will try to have a place that explains these decisions um, eventually. So that is um, all of this presentation, and I thank you very much for your attention. And we, as Peter um, Stephen mentioned, we will be taking questions 
and answers at the end, and you can put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Thank you. And now it goes on to back to, back to you, Stephen. Yep. Okay. And the next presentation is from T. Bao Tran Phan of Library and Archives Canada, and she submitted a video. So I will move to her screen and see if we can't get this to work the way we want. Oops, it, I moved, I'm sorry, try that again. Um, well, my name is Tran, I'm Acting Manager of Bibliographic Description, someone Library will let me know and Archives if you're hearing Canada, it. and one of the two representatives of the Canadian Committee on Cataloging at NARDAC. I am here today to give you an update on Library and Archives Canada's activities with regards to preparing for the implementation of the official RDA toolkit. Can people hear the presentation? I'll restart it if they are. Otherwise, I'll fix the problem. Somebody unmute and speak? Yes, we can hear it. Oh, great, great, thanks. Please note that this presentation will be in English only, but we will make uh, available the French version of the slides. Before we begin, I would like to give a little reminder of the context in which we work. Library and Archives Canada is a bilingual national institution with French and English as the official languages. As such, we create the bibliographic and authority records in French or English or both, depending on the language of the publication we are describing. This means that since we change our library system to OCLC World Share Management Services in 2018, we have been working in two separate files for authorities. NACL for English language authority records and Canadiana for French language authority records. Also in June of last year, we launched the Francophone Name Authority Program, also known as PBAN. This means that we now share the responsibility of maintaining the Canadiana file with Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec and 15 French speaking universities in Quebec. What this means for policy statements is that we are trying to align ourselves as much as possible to the policies already established by Library of Congress, the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, and the PFAN, all while being specific to Canada and our own practices where needed. Furthermore, all policy statements must be available in both French and English and must take into account our collaboration with Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec and the cataloging environment, that is OCLC World Share Management Services. So what have we done since the last forum in August? First, Library and Archives Canada has been focusing most of last year on producing documentation for the PFAN. And I'm happy to announce that we have recently made available our wiki at the URLs shown here. We have also made significant progress on the RDA elements to mark authority mapping. The task is now about 60% completed. The mapping were last added to the RDA toolkit in November, and we expect another update to be made uh, in April. The new update will ensure the RDA authority mapping is up to date with the new developments in Mark 21 authority format and make sure the RDA authority mapping are in alignment with the bibliographic mapping. The focus of the RDA authority mapping is to identify gaps in entities like agent, expression, work, person, collective agent, corporate body, and family. The mapping of some inverse elements are currently on hold as well as some controversial mappings, uh, which are also on a hold as we seek more feedback. Comments on the mappings are welcome at the email address here. In terms of policy statement, we are currently reviewing the policy statements published by the Library of Congress in the December release of the RDA toolkit. However, because we are a bilingual institution, we rely on the translation of the official RDA toolkit into French to make any significant progress or plan for implementation. 
In terms of preliminary timeline, as mentioned, we have started analyzing the policy statements from Library of Congress and the official RDA toolkit in December, and we expect the translation of the official RDA toolkit into French to be completed at the end of this uh, calendar year. From there, we can start our own work and uh, hope to complete the documentation are for PFAN uh, based on the official RDA toolkit at the end of December 2022. Of course, instructions that differ from NACO will need to be translated again to English. So this is how we see our timeline for the moment. Of course, we will make sure to communicate more information uh, to the, the library community as they become available. So thank you very much for your time and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. My name is Tran, I'm acting manager of the- Sorry for that. And before we uh, turn to Bob Maxwell for his presentation, uh, in order not to interrupt his presentation, I suggest we take a five minute break. Um, it's a little early for that, but I think this will help us get through the program and have more time for questions later. So I would say please rejoin us in five minutes, which would be 12.51 on my time, but whatever 51 on your time. And then we will resume. We would ask Bob Maxwell to continue. Hey, thank you, everybody. I hope you, if you can't hear me, you will just let me know, but I think you can. Um, I'm Bob Maxwell from Brigham Young University, and I'm one of the two representatives uh, to NARDAC from the American Library Association. And I just thought when I was thinking about what to talk about here is that many people, including me, are have been confused about the organization of all this, everything behind RDA. And so I thought maybe we could do a little guide that might help us through the maze. And it is a maze. Many of us uh, say, who is in charge here anyway? And there's all these entities and acronyms that we hear about, and we'll talk about some of them today. So let's start with NARDAC. NARDAC stands for the North American RDA Committee. And it represents the interests of <laughs> North American catalogers, which are defined for this context as everything that excludes Latin America and the Caribbean, which means North American for purposes of NARDAC means the United States and Canada. And its membership consists of two members for the American Library Association two members from the Canadian Committee on Cataloging, two members from the Library of Congress. I'm sorry, something happened to the logo there in the, on, the, on your screen. Um, and one of those members is the NARDAC representative to the RDA Steering Committee. So that's the basic format. The current composition is uh, the American Library Association members are uh, Stephen Hearn, Chair, and me, Robert L. Maxwell, the Canadian uh, Committee on Cataloging Representatives are Thomas Brendorfer, who is also the NARDAC representative to the RDA Steering Committee, and Thibaut Tran Phan, whom we just heard from, uh, from the Library of and Archives Canada. The Library of Congress representatives are Melanie Paluda, who is also the NACO coordinator of web content. So if you have complaints about that, you can apply to her, and Clara Liao. Um, just to, okay, so, okay. now, at the American Library Association rep, uh, level, United States catalogers are represented and make proposals for changes or additions to RDA through the American Library Association. Um, the principal committee that is involved here is the Committee on Cataloging Descripti Description and Access, which most people just refer to as CCDA. CCDA meets twice a year when ALA meets. Um, recently, we have not been 
having ALA uh, in person. And so CCDA has been kind of meeting around the time ALA usually meets, but presumably it will continue to meet twice a year, but it is a, one of these working committees that works throughout the year. The current chair is Glenn Wiley, if you are interested, and, and it's um, web address is on the screen here. The Canadian Committee on Cataloging uh, is the committee that represents Canadian catalogers and they make proposals to, for changes to RDA through the Canadian Committee on Cataloging or CCC. CCC also meets twice a year and it's experimenting with beginning to meet four times a year to kind of match what the, um, the RDA steering committee's schedule is, but like CCDA, it also works throughout the year. The current chair is Sue Andrews and here is its uh, web address on the, on the screen. So now going the other direction, NARDAC uh, is, rep, uh, is um, sort of in between the ALA committees and the C committee, Canadian Committee on Cataloging and um, the RDA Steering Committee itself. And as I mentioned, NARDAC is represented in the RDA Steering Committee by the NARDAC representative, Thomas Brendorfer. And so any, any um, um, revision proposals uh, from ALA or the Canadian Committee on Cataloging funnel up through NARDAC and then eventually get to RDA. So at the RDA level, this is its organization. It has a chair who is Kathy Glennon and we will be hearing from her, um, I think next. Its secretary is Linda Barnhart. There are three regional representatives, one for Europe, one for North America and one for Oceania. There is an examples editor, Honor Moody. The technical team liaison officer is Damien Isaminger. There is a translation team liaison officer, Daniel Paradis, and a wider community engagement officer, Eva Cartus. The intent is to have representatives not just from three regions, but from these six regions, Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America and the, Car and the Caribbean, North America and Oceania. As I mentioned on the previous slide, Oce uh, Europe, North America and Oceania are the only ones that are currently represented in the RDA steering committee. So now there's another, another committee called, or another or organization group called the RDA board. So speaking of who's in charge here, what, what do they have to do with this? Um, well, the RDA board has charge of certain aspects of RDA. Um, some of you who have been around for a while might recognize the name of its predecessor, the Committee on Principles, or Prin the Committee of Principles. Um, the RDA Steering Committee reports to the RDA board. So I suppose you could say that the board is ultimately in charge. As of February 21st, uh, so this is who's in the, on the board. Um, ALA is one of the uh, copyright holders and they have a representative, but as of February 21st of this year, that is, uh, slot is not filled. Uh, the Canadian Federation of Library Associations is one of the other copyright holders and that is represented by Christine Oliver, who is also the chair of the board. The Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals, or CILIP, which is the um, successor, I believe you could say, to the British Library Association, is, uh, is represented by John Trevor Allen. Then another member of the board is the chair of the RDA Steering Committee, Kathy Glennon, and the representative from ALA Publishing, James Henley, whom we will also hear from in a few minutes. There are also uh, six national institution representatives on the board um, from Africa, Asia, Europe, Latin America and, the America and the Caribbean, North America and Oceania. So you will notice these are not the same people as the representatives to the RDA steering committee. Um, in the case of the board, this part of the organization has been fully staffed now, as you can see. 
and each one has a staggered three-year term. As noted earlier, a parallel organization is intended for the RDA steering committee, but it has not yet been fully staffed. So what are the functions of these two groups? Um, the board and the copyright holders together um, set the strategic direction for RDA. So they are the ones who approve major undertakings like the 3R project, which we recently concluded. The RDA steering committee is responsible for the development and content of the RDA standard, including all revisions, additions, and other changes to the standard itself. Okay, we're gonna pause for a moment on this, to contemplate this beautiful slide, which Kathy Glennon was kind enough to provide and prepare for this presentation. Uh, this is an up-to-date diagram. You can see it's as of March 24th of the relationships between all of these bodies and it has its debut today. And so we can all applaud Kathy here on her, in her next presentation, which will be up next. You will notice that NARDAC is in the, the dark blue rectangle near the bottom of the center. Kathy did not include the bodies funneling into our NARDAC or EURIG or ORDAC, which stand for the European and Ocean Oceanian Regional Bodies, but you can imagine them as part of the dark blue rectangles. That would be for NARDAC, LC, ALA, and CCC. This diagram covers just about everything we've talked about so far. So we'll pause for just another second for you to have a chance to look and look around at it. This looks a little bit like some of those diagrams of the semantic web I saw way at the beginning of my career. Okay, so what we don't see here is any mention of the program for cooperative cataloging. And this is because the PCC does not have a direct relationship to the RDA operation. Nevertheless, it looms very large in RDA land and it certainly is influential. So next we need to talk about PCC and its contribution. So PCC stands for the Pro Program for Cooperative Cataloging. And uh, the first point I'd like to make is that PCC, even though maybe it's synonymous in some people's minds, has a much narrower const constituency than NARDAC. Only a subset of the US Canadian cataloging catalogers that work for an institution, uh, sorry, let me just start. <laughs> Uh, it comprises only a subset of the U.S. and Canadian catalogers, and it's that the subset is those that work for a PCC institution. Um, I was unable to find any figures, but I would imagine this comprises less than, I'm sure it's less than 10% of uh, all, all catalogers in the U.S. and ca Canada, maybe much less than that. So, first of all, PCC has a much narrower constitu constitu constituency than NARDAC, which represents all the catalogers in the United States and Canada. But on the other hand, paradoxically, PCC also has a much broader constituency than NARDAC because it includes many institutions outside of the United States and Canada. In fact, about a tenth of um, PCC institutions are not in the United States or Canada, 72 out of 749. The PCC also does encompass various specialist communities that have interests in RDA, including some of the PCC funnel operations. Um, so while I'm not gonna talk about them in detail, I should mention that there are also other organizations such as the Music Library Association that have indirect uh, relationships similar to PCC's relationship to the RDA or operation and are also important contributors. Um, the PCC, okay, no, let's move on. This is the organization of the PCC. <laughs> it has a chair, who is now Melanie Wecker, uh, plus uh, in the policy committee uh, is the chair elect, the incoming chair, and the past chair. There are four permanent members a representative from British Library, from Library of Congress, from, the Li from Library and Archives Canada, and from OCLC. There are also other members 
including several at-large members. And these members represent BIBCO, Concert, NACO, and SACO, which are the programs that the PCC administers, one for bibliographic records, one for serials, one for name authorities, and one for subject authorities. And more than one uh, at-large members represent each one of these. There are also three standing committees in the program, um, the Standing Committees on Applications, Standards, and Trainings, and their chairs are part of the policy committee. Plus, there are a number of advisors and liaisons from other organizations that attend this meeting. PCC also has a steering committee, which consists of the, the chair, as well as representatives from Library of Congress, OCLC, and the PCC Secretariat. So the Library of Congress is, does serve as, as the or at least staffs completely, the Secretariat for the Program for Cooperative Cataloging and its responsibilities um, include facilitating the operations of the Policy Committee, the Steering Committee, and BIDCO, Concert, NACO, and SACO. So um, all of us in PCC are quite grateful to the, to the Library of Congress for uh, giving um, many of their positions over almost some, some of them almost entirely to the operation of PCC. And that's what's called the Secretariat. So just a point I wanted to make, although many non-PCC institutions within the realm of NARDAC choose to follow PCC policy, PCC only has authority to make policy for con contributions to PCC programs. So all those PCC policy statements that um, Melanie was talking about a few minutes apply to the Library of Congress, which is a PCC institution, and other PCC uh, institutions when they make contributions to um, the PCC programs. So what is the difference between NARDAC and PCC or their, or, or their roles? And I just was thinking about it and I think, okay, they, they both have different kind of products. We can talk about that. Um, the product of NARDAC in concert with the RDA steering committee is a set of guidelines and instructions for metadata creation, which we call resource description and access. So that's the product of, of NARDAC. The product of PCC on the other hand is metadata. Um, PCC was set up to help to facilitate the creation of metadata. It also creates some metadata standards such as some vocabularies, workflows, and best practices outside of RDA, but its chief product in my opinion is metadata. Both of these um, groups do produce training, but training is not the main product or the purpose of either entity. Now, PCC doesn't have a direct relationship to NARDAC, or this is evidenced by the fact that there is no PCC representative to NARDAC. It does have an indirect relationship via its member institutions, one of which is the Library of Congress, and LC does have a direct relationship to NARDAC. It has two representatives on NARDAC, as we've seen. Um, other US and Canadian PCC institutions have an indirect relationship via ALA or CCC. And by and large, the PCC, if it wants to make as, a, as an organization, some sort of uh, revision change uh, to RDA, it has in the past traditionally been done through ALA's um, CCDA committee. So while uh, PCC doesn't have a direct relationship to NARDAC. It's an extremely influential organization and its activities and policies regarding RDA are very important. And here are some of the current activities and initiatives of PCC. Um, the PCC URIs and MARC pilot, if successful, may allow our data to move closer, closer to RDA scenario A, which is linked open data. This pilot has produced a best practice guidelines document and so that's a pretty important activity um, that is pretty directly related to RDA. Um, probably the most important activity right now, as we have just heard as a PCC member, LC is taking the lead in getting the current LC PCC policy statements into their appropriate places in the new RDA. This stage of the project should be complete in a few months as Melanie reported. Then there will be a comment period 
as well as in cooperation with the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, especially its Standing Committee on Standards, there will be work on creating new policy statements that will be necessary for the implementation, implementation of the new RDA. Um, another activity that I think has not really started yet, but needs to move along and will start soon, I hope, um, is the documenting of PCC policies for string and coding schemes, which are being removed from RDA proper uh, and moved to that community section of, of RDA, as Thomas mentioned earlier today. Okay, thanks. I think that's all for now, and we can answer questions later on if there are any. Thank you, Bob. And our next speaker will be Kathy Glennon. Oh, click, click twice there. You should be in control, Kathy. Great. Thank you. Well, welcome. Um, welcome. Welcome to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about RSC operations in 2021 and couch that in terms of a return to normality. Uh, as you know, we've been doing the 3R project for some time and we have come out behind that and now it's time to start acting like the RSC sort of used to, to look. So I'm Kathy Glennon, Chair of the RDA Steering Committee and in my spare time I'm Head of Cataloging and Metadata Services at the University of Maryland. So today I'm briefly going to hit highlights from the RSC action plan for this year, talk a little bit about RSC meetings when they're scheduled, what we talk about, and then give an overview of the three different ways we think about changing RDA content. So the highlights for our action plan are linked in our rolling three-year plan, and these are just the highlights. The plan itself, I believe, is two pages long. So you've heard some of this already. We are continuing the review of the resources tab and the development of the community resources and community vocabulary section. We need to work on resolving the pseudo element issues. And these are primarily the specialized instructions that you find in original RDA 6.28 through 6.31 about creating access points for musical works, legal works, religious works, and official communications. We need to review performance aggregates as amalgamation instructions and initiate cleanup. We need to begin bib frame mapping. It's important as people start working to implement a bib frame and integrate it with RDA that there is a mapping that's available in the toolkit. We have some unfinished business from the 3R project, and we, to accomplish that, we plan on establishing four new working groups throughout the course of the year. One on extent, one on disambiguating place and jurisdiction, one on preferred names, pretty much preferred names associated with corporate bodies that operate in more than one language, and we need to look at the religious content overall. And of course, we want to be responsive to user feedback. We have a quarterly meeting schedule now, which are primarily conducted asynchronously. We held our first one this year in January. Uh, the next one is coming up soon in April. We have one in July. And for all of these, the deadline for submitting agenda object, uh, uh, documents for RSC consideration is approximately three weeks before the meeting starts. This allows our members to read and contemplate the issues and share them with our communities as needed. We typically have an in-person meeting. Uh, this is currently scheduled for October. I do not have a lot of confidence that we will be meeting in person. We certainly will not be meeting where we hoped to meet in any case. So this date is not firm. It may change based on travel restrictions. If we're able to hold an in-person meeting, we might need to adapt our meeting time based on when that space might be available. Um, or if we need to shift to a virtual meeting, then that will put a little more play into play. But again, the deadline for submitting agenda documents is about three weeks before the meeting starts. Our asynchronous meetings include brief reports from members on their activities since the last meeting, including information sharing from the regions. 
We might review and approve documents that we've developed since the previous meeting. We may have discussion papers framing future work or proposals for change. And so here's an example of some of the content from our January meeting. We reviewed and approved the ruling three-year action plan, updating it for the next three years. We reviewed and approved updated RSC operations documents, how we conduct our business. Uh, we can discuss how we might move forward on pseudo elements. And we also discuss next steps with community resources. Our in-person meeting agendas are a little more formal and a little more intense because we're there in person and we're not doing our day jobs at the same time. So these agendas include formal reports from members, working groups, and liaison to outside groups as an annual coverage of that content. We would have discussion papers and change proposals that would benefit from a more focused discussion. We will lay the groundwork for the next iteration of the rolling three-year action plan and we'll have a status review and update of action items assigned to RSC members. If the in-person meeting needs to be held virtually, we will generally follow the practice we did in 2020. We will expand the meeting length from one to two weeks and we will use a meeting style that blends both synchronous and asynchronous approaches. And the, the uh, steering committee will advise as to what did and didn't work last year uh, if we have to go this way this year. So let's take a look at the RDA change proposal process. This is still in a test and adjust phase. Uh, there are guidance to communities, uh, both as detailed processes in RSC operations for policies and procedures for updating RDA content, and actually a little bit of a sample and formatting information in RSC operations five guidelines for proposals, discussion papers, and responses to them. There are three possibilities for having us consider changes. One is fast track, one is discussion paper, and the last is proposal. And I'll go into each one of those separately. The steps are to prepare an initial paper of whichever kind it belongs to. The RSC discusses it and decides on next steps, and then we implement it if that's applicable. So fast track proposals are suggestions for improving consistency in wording, additions to vocabularies and other changes without wider impact. These must be capable of inclusion in RDA without negative impact on our users. And it must be technically compatible with RDA. And the tech, RSC's technical working group is more than happy to tell us if that is or is not the case. These may be submitted any time to the RSC chair and RSC secretary and they originate with RSC members via working groups, regionals, region recommendations, such as something coming from NARDAC, personal observations, or whatever else. Uh, they can originate with users primarily via the submit feedback link in the toolkit. If we notice something, then one RSC member might take that up and turn it into a fast track. Normally, the fast tracks will be discussed in the order received. Right now, we are operating under a short decision-making time frame of two weeks with one week for discussion and one week for voting. We are also currently only considering one or one grouping of these at a time. These are not publicly posted on the RSC website. There are no formal responses required. The decisions are made by the RSC voting members. The regional representatives may consult with regions at their discretion, but they don't have to. And the RSC choices are to accept revise, refer to the proposal process, or reject the fast track proposal. And the referral to the proposal process would mean that it didn't meet the criteria for a fast track or that it turned out to be more complicated than we thought. A simple majority of the RSC is required to pass a fast track proposal. Accepted fast track proposals will be implemented in, the, in a future toolkit release, which may or may not be the next one based on the timing of the RSC's decision. In all of this, there are no substantive differences from the process we followed for fast tracks before the 3R process. Approved so far this year, we're largely for editorial consistency. We changed the phrase that reflects to reflecting in definitions for four categorization elements. We clarified definitions for date of capture, polarity, and bibliographic format when we revised five letter or agent elements for consistency and clarity. 
And also we made uh, some changes to two paragraphs in the fictitious and hum non-human appellations guidance chapter to promote clarity of application. You can imagine that asking for a formal paper and, and responses for changing something like that reflects to reflecting would be uh, a rather ridiculous waste of time. So this is how fast track proposals are used. Discussion papers, on the other hand, raise topics for RSC consideration to suggest a need for investigation of issues related to RDA development, to identify issues related to other rulemaking bodies, and so forth. These are recommended strongly for complex proposed changes before they go through the formal proposal process, and that is especially useful when more than one approach or solution is possible. Discussion papers are the same as briefing papers, which was a term used near the end of the three hour project for those of you who follow these things closely. The RSC discussed that there really was no difference and we will be abandoning the briefing paper term and returning to just using the phrase discussion paper. These may be submitted anytime to the RSC chair and RSC secretary who will schedule them for an upcoming meeting. This may or may not be the next RSC meeting based on the RSC's workload and or the complexity of the topic. Discussion papers may originate with RSC members, RDA regional groups, or RDA users who are not represented in regional groups via the wider community engagement officer. The RSC may request discussion papers. We come, some topic comes up and we think that needs to be worked on. We need someone to write a discussion paper about that. But we also welcome ground up user generated discussion papers. Before submission, the proposers will consult with the RSC technical working group to confirm that the recommendations are technically compatible with RDA. These will be posted publicly on the RSC website with information about when that discussion paper will be discussed by the RSC. RSC members may consult with each other before the official RSC meeting where the discussion is scheduled. And in fact, that is encouraged. These discussions will not be captured formally. Before the RSC meeting, the regional representatives will consult with the bodies they represent. So in this case, as you heard from Bob, that's now NARDAC, URIG, and ORDAC. Each region will develop its own process for collecting feedback because each region is organized differently. For example, as Bob noted, NARDAC will seek feedback from ALA, CCC, and LC. All regional bodies are expected to respond in some way to discussion papers, but we are looking to minimize the amount of effort and time frame for this step from the pre-3R process. We do need to have a response to each question that's in the paper, however. Discussion papers may be, after the, as a result of the RDA discussion, referred back to the proposer or proposing group for more development or investigation based on our discussion. This may include the request to prepare a formal proposal. We could defer the discussion paper to a later date, or we could reject it outright. The outcomes of these decisions will be in the meeting minutes, and of course, we will share the, the details with the proposing group or individual as appropriate. There are some differences from the three pre-R era. Discussion papers may be accepted anytime. They could be considered at any of the quarterly RSC meetings and not just the in-person meeting. Consultation among RSC members is permitted and perhaps even encouraged in advance of the meeting. And we will develop a log to indicate briefly the agreement, disagreement, or general comments to help with the RSC's discussion We'll prepare that in advance of when it will be discussed. So after all that, what are proposals? These are formal recommendations to change, enhance, or delete RDA content. There is no requirement that a change proposal must start out as a discussion paper, but as I noted before, that step is recommended for complex topics. These may be submitted any time to the RSC chair and RSC secretary, and they will be scheduled for an upcoming RSC meeting. As you've heard me say before, this may not be the next meeting based on our workload or the complexity of the topic. In fact, much of what I have to say about proposals you will have heard before, and so I won't belabor the points. They originate with the same groups as the discussion papers. And as with discussion papers, the RSC may request them 
And of course, they need to be RDA compatible and the technical working group stands ready to ensure that. They will be posted publicly on the RSC website with information about when they will be discussed. And again, RSC members are encouraged to consult with each other before the meeting, but that will not be a part of any kind of official discussion and capture. Before the RSC meeting, regional representatives consult with the bodies they represent and as with discussion papers, each region will do its own thing as makes sense to them. All regional bodies are expected to respond in some way, but again, we are looking to minimize the amount of effort and time frame for this step. Formal responses will be posted publicly on the RSC website, and those responses must contain an explicit statement of acceptance or non-acceptance. We need to have a response to each recommendation in the proposal. During the discussion, a proposal may be withdrawn by the proposer. This has happened in the past and it might happen again. Otherwise, we'll have a discussion and vote with the similar choices of accept, revise, refer for more work or reject. Again, a simple majority is needed to pass and the outcomes of the decisions will be in the meeting minutes and shared with the appropriate proposing group or individual as appropriate. They will be implemented in a future toolkit release it might not be the next one based on the complexity of making the agreed upon changes. Changes from the 3R procedures are similar to that with discussion papers. These can be accepted anytime. They could be cons considered at any of the quarterly RSC meetings and not just the in-person meeting. Again, consultation among members is permitted. We will develop a log and make that public so that we can be prepared for our, to focus our discussion when we actually discuss proposals. And we are looking to minimize efforts from the regional representatives. We no longer want a formal response that effectively simply says, we agree uh, that that happened in the past. And if that's all it is, we need to just put that in the, the log table and that should suffice for that communication. In the works, uh, we have more fast track proposals. They're coming at a steady pace. We have some formal proposals likely to show up perhaps by July. Nardex curator agent proposal, which was much more complicated than any of us hoped, uh, is currently undergoing review by the RSC technical working group before the RSC will consider it. And this may be on the July agenda. There's also uh, Yurig asked if we could rename an element and we decided that was a little bit beyond a fast track. And so if they want to pursue that, renaming an element would also be a formal proposal. If you want more information about anything I talked about, uh, the action plan is on the RSC website. The RSC meeting calendar is on the RSC website, our agendas, the, at least the public portions of them are available on the RSC website and the operations documents I mentioned before. These are two of the six operation documents that we have. And if you have questions that I don't get to today, please email me at rscchair at rdatoolkit.org. I will answer your questions if they go to my University of Maryland address, but it's a little easier for me to keep things separate. Uh, so if you can manage that, I'd appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And next will be James Henley. Got it, James. But we're not here. Okay, you. thank you. I just uh, had to unmute myself. Uh, hi, everyone. I'll just reintroduce myself again, real quick. I'm James Henley. I'm a director of RDA Toolkit, and I'm just going to give you a quick update on what we're doing with the toolkit. Um, hopefully, most of you are aware that the 3R project has completed, it was shifted to the official um, official status, the new toolkit on December 15th. Uh, the project did achieve its uh, significant goals of uh, introducing a responsive design, uh, one that includes um, access, meets, I shouldn't say includes, meets accessibility standards and uh, implements the LRM. We can also see that we uh, 
or you can, may, may not see it, you can see it. We kind of restructured the whole uh, toolkit, both on the front end and the back end. Um, and that back end restructuring is going to be important for future development and being able to do more interesting things with the toolkit and improve um, the user experience. And we also introduced some um, integrated content. Um, that's kind of, you see that in uh, what we call the right rail display. I think Melanie showed that a couple times um, where we can put policy statements right alongside the RDA instructions they reference. Um, our next steps, um, we're gonna, we're gonna continue with uh, work on translations. The Norwegian translation is uh, current with the uh, December release of the toolkit, the Finnish um, are making progress and will soon be there. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty about some of the other translations right now. Um, so there's a lot of work still to do in that area. Same with policy statements, you got a good uh, update on LC policy statements. Already today, uh, BL, British Library is working on their policy statements and they'll continue to add, be added to the toolkit with each release. And um, with this next release in April, you will see uh, an initial um, sampling of, uh, of Music Library Association best practices policy statements in the toolkit. Um, we have bigger plans for future development um, going down the road. Probably you won't see much in the um, this calendar year of 2021, but down the road, we hope to add a visual browser that we've talked about in the past and um, a mapping tool, a tool that basically makes it a little more, uh, a full-fledged tool that um, gives us a lot more um, flexibility in how we display, say, a mapping between RDA and MARC or RDA and BibFrame. Um, and that might be the higher priority right now over a visual browser. Um, I think I missed one here. I just want to talk real quick about our um, release dates. Oh, I have that on the other. Okay. Oh, sorry. I don't even know my own slides. Um, orientation efforts. So we are continuing with the RDA lab series, which is led by uh, Kate James, um, who's um, been working on a, um, her series is basically is an opportunity to kind of get some uh, practical experience working with the, um, some of the new concepts and practices uh, in RDA that are related to the LRM and other things. Uh, we'll continue to do some toolkit demos. We have a YouTube channel that if you haven't subscribed to that yet, I suggest you do. It has helpful videos of um, how to do things on the toolkit, plus um, some videos of presentations that we think are uh, really strong and helpful. We have a few print products out right now. We have the RDA Glossary. Uh, we also have Introducing RDA, a guide to basics after 3R. That's by Chris Oliver. It's um, a short, it's uh, kind of a follow up on her uh, original introduction to RDA. And I think it's a really useful book for just kind of getting a handle on the significant changes of um, that were brought about by 3R and how to move forward um, from there, how to kind of address those changes and, and make some um, um, and get ready to adapt to these changes in the toolkit. Um, also, uh, the RDA workbook will be coming out um, soon, actually. This is a, a workbook by Kate James based on the RDA lab series, and it really kind of collects together some um, cataloging um, problems, if you will, or exercises that will help you adapt to um, the changes in RDA. And um, we're gonna get to work. I talked to Thomas today, uh, Thomas Brendorfer, who talked earlier. Uh, he and I had a brief discussion. We're gonna meet next week and talk about how we can get an update to RDA Essentials going. Um, and then of course, some. Uh, I think Kathy mentioned the submit feedback button on the toolkit, use that if you're having any problems or concerns about how the new toolkit works. Um, that's really kind of a place to submit ideas for making the toolkit better. 
or if you think there's an error in it, reporting that. If you're having problems logging in, don't use the submit feedback button. If you're having access issues, please contact me directly if you're having access issues so we can resolve them right away. Uh, the RDAL discussion list has moved to ALA Connect. Um, this is gonna give us a lot more reliable service and exchange of um, thoughts and ideas on the list. Um, it does require that you join ALA Connect. So you have to kind of take this initial step of going to ALA Connect, joining it. it doesn't make you an A, you don't have to be an ALA member. You don't have to, uh, you're not gonna get bombarded with emails from ALA about, uh, you know, that are unrelated to RDA or anything like that. And you can set it up. So you just interact with the list through email and nothing else. Nothing more than that. You don't. So after that initial login with ALA Connect, and once you join, you should be all set to go. Um, so our release schedule for the next year. So next week we do have a new release coming out. Um, it will contain um, updates to policy statements, um, both LC, British Library, and MLA, as I stated. Some updates to the translations. And um, it will include that move of the pseudo elements that uh, Kathy discussed to the uh, community resources area. And we'll have further development of that community resources area. Uh, the next uh, release after that is scheduled for July 27th. Um, I may have, this date was uh, determined quite a while ago. And in the interim, ALA has informed me of some schedule requirements on their end. So I may have to move that date up a week or two. So um, we'll make an announcement about that if it does move. And then a third release on October 5th. Um, and then there's just a brief update on how we've uh, responded to the COVID issue. We've extended, we did a period of extended free trials and extended grace periods for um, paying the bills because we were all kind of adjusting to a new, normal that we hope isn't normal forever. And um, we are currently offering a lot of uh, discounted pricing options for new or um, subscribers who have lapsed but would like to return to the toolkit. So you can contact, um, contact uh, me and my team uh, if you're interested in any of that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. I tried to kind of go fast because I know this has been a long webinar. Um, if you're having any issues uh, with the toolkit, at getting access, RDA toolkit at ALA.org is the way to reach us. Um, and if you have any questions about subscriptions and pricing, you could use that same address, RDA toolkit at ALA.org. And of course, I'm always happy to hear from people directly. Uh, my email address is right there, jhenley at ALA.org. So um, I will and there and pass it on to Stephen. Thank you, James. And my concluding remarks are gonna be looking at the relationship between RDA and encoding formats. Um, this is becoming a, a point of a lot of discussion as we see the emergence of BibFrame as a, uh, an important format and Synopia as a Bib frame based, uh, but also more flexible uh, data encoding system for cataloging and the continued use of MARC. And I think we, we should have a sense of you know, what is involved in encoding questions. And what is the difference between a content standard, which we think of RDA as, and an encoding? Uh, a content standard tells us what to record and roughly how to record it. Um, but it doesn't tell us how to code it so that a machine could interpret it. Uh, the encoding we use formalizes the analysis of what's being said in terms of categories of terms, the terminology itself, and how we're going to arrange them and syndicate as the syntax with is how you arrange things and how you mark different elements as being distinct for both human and machine interpretation. And RDA is using RDF to basically provide both a content standard, in my opinion, 
and a kind of encoding for the kinds of relationships that it wants to express. It's building on linked data. Linked data is a really simple syntax, a simple analysis of how we can make statements about the world. It says you can do a statement with a subject, predicate, and an object. And the subject is what I'm talking about. The predicate is how it relates to something. And the object is the value, the, the word, or the entity, if I use something that represents an entity, that has that relationship to the subject. It's not a syntax you would use for poetry. It has no sense of the poetic at all. It's about statements of, of logical relationships. And because you can use a URI to express the subject and the predicate and the object, it becomes a very networked kind of uh, statement because each of these terms, the three basic elements of the linked data statement become access points to larger pools of information about each of those things. The reason it's so nice to have a simple syntax is it makes it much easier to compare statements made in an RDF. Uh, any RDF resource description framework statement is going to use these three pieces and you can line them up and see if they are compatible. You can build tables and tell you whether this predicate is equal to or similar to that predicate. Likewise, object and subject entities. So it's, it's simple. The RDA registry, which is, remember, an open linked data vocabulary, uh, it's outside the toolkit. You don't need a subscription to get to the RDA registry. Um, if you search, I think it's www.rdaregistry slash info slash you'll, you'll get access to it. And it includes a lot of the value of RDA in linked data uh, uses. It has addresses for the predicates that RDA is defining. And it includes now maps and alignments for how some of the RDA elements, which are basically the predicates, uh, compare to other encoding formats. And when we talk about comparisons, we're generally talking about whether things are the same or different. And we often come at this with a sort of a uh, wistful assumption that, that we all live in a common world, that we all see the same world, we all breathe the same air, and, and so forth, and that there's a basic sameness to uh, the world. And while I think that may be true, and it's, I think it's true at the level of, of ethics and ideals, it breaks down when you get into actually conceptualizing the, the world, uh, building a conceptual model of what things are distinct from what other things, and what things have subparts and what don't, and so forth. And once you start doing that, your conceptual models differ. So that one encoding is going to be able to say things that another encoding is not. And that's why it becomes important to choose one, because they are not all just different ways of saying the same set of things. In the RDA guidance section on what well-formed RDA is, we read that a metadata statement is conformant with RDA if all of the following are met. Statement is well formed, which I take to mean subject, predicate, object, RDF. Uh, the statement describes an instance of an RDA entity, because RDA is not meant to describe the world, it's meant to describe the, the WEMI and the person, corporate body, family, uh, set of entities, time span, and place. Too. Uh, the values of an element are. Uh, statement records the value of an RDA element assigned to an entity, and the statement records a value that is compatible with the RDA guidance and instructions. So to be conformant, you have to be able to you know, use an RDA set of elements, predicates, or use some kind of encoding that is comparable to a valid RDA uh, element. And that, that's what you need to be conformant with RDA. And it's pretty basic. When we look at some of the encoding mappings, we can see that, that there's a real imbalance between the general and the specific, between RDA and other 
uh, encodings. Dublin Core, we know, is a very simple encoding system. And that explains why, if we look at the latter half of this list, Dublin Core Terms contributor maps to many different, and this is just a tiny segment of the list, many different uh, RDA elements related to entities, related to expressions. Um, they all sort of get telescoped and collapsed into DC Terms contributor. And you can see in the little snippet above of uh, the earlier part of this list that date appears twice and other versions of date and so forth will appear down the list of this very long mapping. So you, you lose specificity if you're encoding with Dublin Core terms, no surprise there. When you look at the mappings with MARC terms, uh, again, if you look at the right-hand column, you'll see basically you're describing the same MARC encoding, which is a 100, 100 field with certain specific subfields. And that maps to many different RDA elements uh, describing the relationships of persons to works. Not surprising again, but it does show that from this mapping's perspective, uh, RDA is much more granular than Mark is. There's also a mapping and an alignment with the Mark relators, which takes the Mark relators as, as what? As another way of expressing an, a relationship uh, which they are, RDA relators have, have uh, URI equivalents, and you could put them into uh, a linked data statement to express a relationship between uh, a work and a person. And when we look at this, we see again that uh, the MARC relators um, have a narrower value than the RDA, and this time it's sort of reversed, but oops, let me go back to that. Um, but it's reversed because the RDA includes specifics about whether uh, something is, uh, well, the, oh, the, I'm sorry, let me back up. In the left-hand column, what we see are values from, that is uh, labels from the unconstrained RDA element. So the unconstrained RDA elements do not specify whether something is a person or a corporate body or, uh, or a family. It's just saying the relationship. So you can have has author uh, mapped to lots of different um, terms because you're, and you're also not specifying, um, well, what, what I wanna say is, the mark relators uh, correspond in by themselves better to the unconstrained elements in RDA than they would to the constrained elements. But if you synthesize both the mark relators and the mark tagging as uh, ways of encoding the relationship between a work and an entity, then you could build a mapping which would be more precise more specific and more comparable between the two. So for instance, if you say 700 indicator one, now I've said I'm talking about a person, I've talked about a, actually more than that, I said a person with a surname first. And I include the subfield for AUT, which is the later code saying, this is the name of the, uh, this is the relationship the person has. That's very close to the RDA element, constrained element, as author person. It includes all those specifics as part of the relationship. So it seems like, you know, if the mark data is including something that could be turned into a relator, uh, it's more compatible and more easily converted to something like the con constrained RDA elements. And the mark encoding expresses constraints similar to RDA when you see all of this as part of what would be preferred mark encoding. Um, and if we draw, were to choose uh, an encoding you know, that was less specific in terms of the way the predicates set up about specifying entity types, 
we would have less conformance with RDA. And this leaves me with the question I continue to ponder uh, in relation to RDA, which is why doesn't RDA declare entity types, entity classes in its description of an entity? If you describe a work, at no point with an RDA element do you say this is a work. It is a work. That's, that's sort of basic RDF is to say this is a ax and assign it to a class of some kind. But there's no RDA element to do that. And people have pointed out to me, well, of course, you can always do that with RDF. RDF schema includes that possibility. It could be added. But why isn't it there? Why isn't it just there? And so that's, that's the strange thing that I've been pondering. And I think we use the predicates to declare the entity type, just like we saw with, and a moment ago with uh, the RDA element, it's specific to person. The RDA, the mark coding is specific to person or corporate body or whatever. Why would we do it that way? Well, one thing it does is it puts so much into the predicate that you can use the predicate alone for deciding how you're gonna map certain index values. You know from the predicate that the term is gonna be a personal name and it can go into an index that's, that's suited for personal names in terms of normalization routines and so forth. You don't have to query the description of the entity in order to say, well, what kind of entity is this? Okay, that's how I will describe it when I, when I can just look at the predicate all by itself and say, and if I'm approaching my cataloging task without knowing much about my entity, if all I have is a name on a title page, I can describe that with 700 or 100, 0, 0, and my indexing programs know what to do with it. I don't have to have any description that declares an entity type for my string. I declared it in the predicate. So my you know, naive, and I admit it's very naive, I'm not a programmer, uh, assumption is that the value of this kind of model that RDA presents and that Mark has presented is that you, you front load a lot of information into predicates so that you can deal with the data more easily when it comes to indexing and other kinds of data manipulation. Uh, you don't have to describe everything you need to uh, include in your, your statements. You just have to say what the relationships and what the entity classes within the predicates are. And this accounts for why there are so many predicates in RDA. It's, it's kind of a sort, lot to sort through, but as we work out better models for collapsing and expanding displays of properties of elements, I think we may find that all easier to work with. And that's the end of my piece. So it's one my X52 and we have time for questions. Um, James, have you been looking at questions enough that you can get us started or shall I call that Sure. Up? I've not only looking at questions, I'm trying to answer them as we go. Oh, excellent. Um, the, uh, we do have a few questions. I'm going to kind of go um, backwards here because there was a question regarding what you were saying. So I'm going to go right into that. Stephen, are you encouraging the use of 700 subfield A and subfield 4 rather than 700 subfield A, subfield E? I'm assuming for the 100 and 600 fields yeah. as well. I mean, to me that you get into a probabilistic question. Uh, you know, how reliable are the label texts that appear in subfield E? I think that they're probably reliable enough that you could do a lot of conversion with a label text and that in some ways would be much more user friendly. Uh, I think you could always generate the label text out of the relators if you have a conversion program to do that. Uh, so the, the, the codes are a little more um, reliable just because we expect a higher adherence to coding values than, than, I mean, think of all the ways people used to write joint author. Then you get in labels, which we think of first as human readable. Um, so, so yes, I think there's potential for both of those to be used in conversion, but you'd have to make a decision looking at, at batches of metadata as to whether it was a safe enough assumption that if it says, this text in the subfield E that it actually means this value in your later codes and that corresponding value in RDA is what I'm saying.
Hello? There were a number of answered questions in the Q&A that uh, if those of you who are attending have not been following along in that, I encourage you to take a look. And I don't know if there's anything in there that folks feel we should talk about in person as well. Um, sorry, I lost my navigation panel there for a second. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, I just wanted to address, there were a couple of questions about um, future courses and trainings. And um, I wanted to let people know that um, I will address uh, the idea of uh, like a, a clean walkthrough of a book workflow on the new toolkit with the e-learning solutions group. Um, I think it's important to know that in this new toolkit, you know, a lot of people comment on the enormous number of options. And that's related to, you know, this is an international standard that's meant to support a lot of different practices. So it's very important um, in this new toolkit that um, trainings are based on um, the RDA instructions in coordination with an application profile or a set of policy statements and guidance from um, leading institutions like the LCPCC, et cetera. And when they begin to kind of put down these kind of set of choices, it will become much easier for groups like ALA and other training organizations to offer trainings that are simple workflows um, through the RDA toolkit. It will also be easier for us on the, uh, as the toolkit developers to um, do filtered um, views of the toolkit content that can follow those um, directions from those organizations. So that's gonna be um, a big part of kind of doing that real uh, kind of basic type of training that some people are talking about. Um, any other questions from anyone? I'll just There's a add, new open one. Yes, and I will add something to what Jamie said just now about the training materials that um, LC, as it creates training materials, will undoubtedly share them through the Catalogers Learning Workshop, which let me share the URL for that real quick. Um, so while I wouldn't say that we are definitely going to be doing that particular type of walkthrough, we will probably be offering something um, similar uh, at, at a certain point. We just haven't gotten to the point where we're developing trading materials yet. Um, okay, there's a new question from Lloyd. Uh, it's directed at Melanie, but I might be able to better answer this, Melanie. Um, <laughs> may unused options, uh, could they be displayed grayed out or in strikeout text or something. Um, that's um, currently in the toolkit that would be difficult to do. That would be a future development we would have. But what we've kind of foreseen for that is if we do have a, a, a kind of application profile from say LC, we can begin to filter out um, the material that's not necessary for their recommended workflow. So you, in a sense, you could, you could not see it then. You could just get a display of the instructions that, were the, uh, that only stated the actions um, that you're supposed to take. Um, that's a little further down the road though for right now. It's not, mm -hmm. um, it's not something that's gonna happen the next year or two, to be frank, okay? Yes. Um, Liliana, Sarah asked, but the four subfield is for the IRI and not for the human interface. The same field for the machine and human readable. To me, the the four is for the mark relator or an IRI. You, you'd want to have your data in the right encoding for whatever process you're trying to run. I mean, the, the subfield E is where it's tricky because it looks like a human readable label and sometimes the, the label that's copied from the, the list that corresponds to the mark relators and sometimes it's not. Okay. 
Okay. John uh, Myers responded to Lloyd's earlier question about display of options, and he's right <laughs> in his comment <laughs> about how they were displayed in the old toolkit, and that's still kind of the same case right now. Mm -hmm. Correct. And Patricia asks, using the same subfield for two things is asking for problems regarding subfield four. Okay. And I would say, yeah, I mean, you could put subfield four in twice if they said the same thing, I would imagine. But the, then you get into the question of, you know, if it's for human reading, it looks cluttered. I think one thing we haven't really achieved yet with linked data is properly blending the human readable with the machine readable and a lot of machine readable content should be hidden or hidden mm -hmm. by label text and then it would actually look much friendlier to us than it does now very true okay i think we're at our pretty much at our time yep so um, we got through all the questions good on us wow <laughs> but but we're always open to receive more questions uh, and we, we really appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, the recording of this will be available. We have the slides. I am assuming or hoping we'll be able to uh, post those somewhere too. So yes. I think you'll be able to get to this content after the event. Yeah, I'll try and get it posted this, this week, but it's kind of a busy week because we also have a release coming out. So I'll do my best though. Um, all right. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time.